Welcome to the Hermetic Astrology Podcast. I'm Gary Caton in Waynesville, North Carolina. You can find me on the web at dreamastrologer.com. Today is Wednesday, June 26th. Later today, Mercury will enter Leo for a short while before stationing retrograde and, and heading back into Cancer. Mercury spending the most time in the water signs this year. Really more time in the three water signs than all the other signs combined. Um, <clears throat> and that's why I call it the Mercury Elemental Year of Water. And that, of course, changes over six to seven years. Um, you can find out all about that lovely cycle in my book, Hermetica Triptica, the Mercury Elemental Year, right? Um, but the other really interesting thing that I've written in articles about, but I haven't written the book on yet, is that Mercury is not just entering Leo, but Mercury is crossing the ecliptic today, um, from going from north to south. And this is very interesting to me because, um, you know, this whole concept of uh, the so-called shadow of the retrograde and blah, 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 where you sort of project the stationary degrees forward and backward. <clears throat> I don't really find that to be tremendously useful, but I do think that when a planet is exactly on the ecliptic plane, that's definitely worth looking at. The, you know, projecting a, a something, you know, an actual event forward and backward into these imaginary shadows, I don't know. I mean, I never got much out of it. But for sure, today, Mercury is dead on the ecliptic. And um, I'll just show you what I mean by that. Um, for those of you who are listening at home, you can find the graphics to go with this on uh, YouTube. So let me just uh, share my screen here. So this is a this is a proper astro astronomically correct um, diagram of Mercury's motion during this upcoming retrograde loop, and it's a loop like this. It doesn't go back and forth and back like this. What you often see uh, represent, I call it a squished S, right? It's like they go, yeah, it goes like this, and it, but it doesn't go like that. And no planet ever does that. So I find it kind of ridiculous that you see this um, squished S, you know, repeated over and over again, because it's absolutely categorically false. No planet ever does that. What Mercury does this time is starts out, this is the ecliptic plane here in the middle, this horizontal line. Mercury does a dive bomb past Mars. They made a really close conjunction. Um, on uh, June 18th, the closest conjunction between any two planets this year. So Mercury dive bombs past Mars, and then right as he's entering, this vertical line represents zero Leo, tropically, right? It's, well, here's the constellation of Cancer. And right as Mercury's crossing into zero Leo, he's also, see how he's crossing the ecliptic plane at the same time, and going down like, that sort of right at, at the edge where that roller coaster like goes over the thing and zoom comes down here and then after stationing direct um, in late July then begins to come back northward and crosses the ecliptic plane again on August 15th. So <clears throat> I think that um, the beginning and ending points for the um, if we want to extend the retrograde experience out past the actual stations, I think these points represent a much more logical and obvious um, way to do that. Mercury is crossing the ecliptic plane, heading south here, um, and north latitude and south latitude were delineated differently um, since way back in um, you know, what's funny is that we've had the information to make this diagram that I'm showing you ever since, um, you know, Ptolemy's Almagest. But for some reason, astrologers never bothered with 
tracking this, um, that, you know, they used it for certain calculations, but they really never did a whole lot with it. Um, and then what happened is it kind of became forgotten. And many modern astrologers have no idea that not only <clears throat> are planets not always on the ecliptic, they're very seldom actually on the ecliptic. So this, this day, as Mercury is dead on the ecliptic, this sits to me is the beginning of the retrograde loop. And, um, you know, it's interesting. So you would expect, oh, you might get um, sort of um, an advance, you know, heads up about all oh, things are shifting, right? So for instance, I went, you know, I'm, I'm heading out on the road tomorrow going out to speak at an astrology conference. And uh, so, you know, I drive an old truck. It's an old 96 Ford F-150 and I'm checking the fluids and making sure, you know, she's, she's got good air pressure in the tire, checking the fluids. And then, you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm going through my mind thinking, cause I'm going up North, I'm going to Ann Arbor, Michigan for the Great Lakes Astrology Conference. And, uh, I'm trying to decide, you know, is it worth it going over to the auto parts store to top off my um, air conditioning? You know, I, I think it has like a slow leak or something. And so I'm going, yeah, do I go old school, you know, what they call 460 air conditioning, right? Four windows down, 60 miles an hour <laughs> and just tough it out. Or do I make the trip over to the auto parts store? And it's supposed to be like, 90 up there and I live in the mountains so we never even see 90 degrees um all summer um so I decided to go for comfort and, and so I go over to the auto parts store and, and so you know I could have just got the can of the Freon and, and brought it home and done the, but I I did it there in the parking lot because guess what the handy guys to to help me are right there in this, and sure enough um, I try, um, stick the, th the can on the, you know, adapter hose thing and trying to pump it in there into the system is not, nothing's happening. And I'm asking the guy, I'm like, am I doing something wrong? You know, he's like, no, nah, it looks like you got it. He's like, you may just have a bum can. So, you know, I could have gone home and, uh, you know, and then found out it was, or not really known, like, wondered if I was doing something wrong or whatever and gone through a whole lot of frustration. But because I, you know, stayed right there at the store and had help available, they were just like, ah, oh, yeah, here, let's put another can on there. And then sure enough, psh, you know, the system charged up. I got cold air coming out and I'm good to go for my trip tomorrow. Right. So, you know, it's stuff like that, where if you know that, something's happening mercury's making this transition heading south crossing the ecliptic things are changing um take a little extra time make sure you do a safety check on your vehicle before you go out on the road you know um you know ask questions about, from people who who can help you and so forth and um you know the quality of your experience might be quite different if you know, you know, if you, if you act according to, um, the knowledge of the, that, the, that things are changing with respect to mercurial functions. Right. Um, so yeah. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's several days before, um, you know, uh, July 7th, it's another week before, um, Mercury actually stations retrograde right on Sunday the 7th so it's more than a week away but because of this crossing of the ecliptic plane and the the whole loop's going to be a southern loop and so Mercury's entering into the south part he's entering into that part where most of the retrograde occurs yeah this might be a way better um, indicator of up oh, this might be the point where things start getting a little funky you know you see what I'm saying um, and then afterwards, um, even after the station, Mercury is going to be getting um, increasingly north in latitude, but he won't actually cross the ecliptic plane again until about August 15th. Um, so, you know, when I was writing for 
astrology.com earlier this year, I made the analogy that, um, you know, it's like you're going down the main highway and you're cruising along and then all of a sudden, whoops, there's a detour sign ahead. You got to get off on a side road and what, you know, so slow down, pay attention, watch for the signs, right? Because you, if you miss the sign, next thing you know, you're going to be off on some back road not knowing where the heck you're going, right? So it's pretty basic stuff. And that's, you see how here, you know, he's going along straight, along the straight and narrow, not on the ecliptic, but relatively parallel to it, passes Mars, and then, you know, the bottom drops out. And I can show you something else that's going on here with which is the reverse you can see here and i've backed this one up until about june 10th just to give us some venus is uh, below the ecliptic plane here and venus is there's a line here that shows you venus's movement so venus is heading northward venus is going to cross the ecliptic plane in a northward fashion um yeah, let's see i've got the date here I think it's uh, July 5th, okay? So Venus is very close to the ecliptic plane right now. So the affairs of Venus are very accentuated um, right now. And Mercury. Mercury is heading south, and he's, and he's heading into a whole retrograde vortex. Venus is pretty much chugging along in direct motion, but she's She's approaching the ecliptic plane and heading from south to north. So there's a transition going on there as well. And if we just animate this, um, and we can plug along for a few days here, you can see, um, so here's Venus, and she's going to be chugging along closer and closer to the ecliptic. You can see Mercury here is going to pass by Mars, and then pretty much... These two are also doing something called coming there. They were out of bounds, which I talked about on the last couple podcasts, and now they're coming back in bounds. And then right after coming in bounds, Mercury goes and does this crazy loop, right? So um, it, it's kind of accentuated also because this cat's been way out in the hinterlands and now he's going to drop down passed by Mars, this is a really close conjunction here. I mean, at this magnification, they, they look like the same dot, right? And then gonna pass by there. Now, here's an interesting thing. Mercury's gonna make three conjunctions with Mars during this retrograde. That's the only planet that Mercury's gonna repeat three aspects with. So I was talking about sort of, you know, the idea of the hero or heroine's adventure, the heroine's journey, um, you know, with Mars being, you know, it's summertime. And also um, see this stationary point right here where Mercury makes the direct station on this star, this bright star, which is Pollux of the Gemini twins. And they were two of the dudes who went on the adventure with Jason of, and the Argonauts. They were Argonauts, Castor and Pollux, right? So there's this idea of this adventure where they went off to help the hero retrieve the Golden Fleece and, and um, you know, Mars of like, you know, um, you know energetically go going after something. Um, but notice that the first conjunction happens not just in, in longitude are they close, but they're very close in latitude as well. Now, Eventually, oh, sorry, I'm going backwards now. <laughs> not yet. Mercury's not retrograde yet. All right, so notice that Mercury passes by Mars, and now Mercury's diving down below the ecliptic. So this is, this is today. This is the situation today. Mercury's dead on the ecliptic. Tomorrow will be below. And you can start to see how the distance between Mars and Mercury will actually begin to close. You have a very strange situation here where the planet Mars, normally way slower than Mercury, is actually faster because Mercury is coming to a stop, right? But notice how even though that gap is closing um, on the horizontal, the longitudinal level, Vertically, that gap is widening, 
Mercury's heading down. So that this second conjunction, as Mars passes Mercury, after Mercury stations retrograde, they are conjunct in longitude. And here's Venus pretty much. Um, Venus has just about crossed the ecliptic going north here by July 8th. So you can see Venus dead on the ecliptic. Mercury and Mars are conjunct again, but this is a different conjunction. Mercury's way down here, and Mars is, of course, still north of the ecliptic plane because Mars, um, Mars's nodes are nowhere in the vicinity of this region of the zodiac. Okay, and then if we keep going, then Mercury um, continues this loop, and there's our second conjunction. So we had the first one on July 8th. Um, sorry, the first one on June 18th, the second one on July 8th, and then uh, another month later on September 9th, we'll have um, Mercury will join Mars again. Mercury will, the speedy Mercury will finally catch and pass Mars again. So, um, and in fact, we have Venus passing Mercury here at one point, right? It looks like, um, looks like about on uh, July 25th, here's Venus passing Mercury. Mercury's way down here below the ecliptic, same way with that Mars was earlier. Venus above, Mercury below. So eventually, Mercury will um, get back in forward motion and chase these two down. And there's going to be this big gathering of um, all the, oops, I want to stop that. Yeah, there's going to be this big gathering of all of the personal planets, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, all five of them. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. There's Sun, Moon, Mars, Venus, and Mercury, all within the first um, decan of Virgo there on August 30th. This is a really potent new moon. Um, and I talked about this in one of my other. Um, so this idea of these three conjunctions with Mercury and Mars and this adventure that's already begun. We had the first um, introduction on June 18th. Now things are changing a little bit as Mercury heads south. We'll have the second conjunction on July 8th and then the final one a um, couple months later on September 9th. Um, and so... What I said about that is the moral of the story seems to be to choose your adventures carefully and understand that it's going to take a while to complete them, right? And then at the same time, when I was writing for the, um, I'm doing this series of uh, the magical transits of 2019, and then we divided it into each quarter. So the magical transits for summer, this is definitely one of them that was a big highlight for me because What's interesting is that all, all of these planets have some kind of dignity in the um, first decan of Virgo. Uh, the, sun has, the sun rules the first decan of Virgo. Mercury has, of course, sign rulership, exaltation, and Mercury also rules the bounds, the first terms of from zero to seven. Of, so Mercury's got like, what, plus five for um, domicile dignity, plus four for exaltation, that's plus nine, and then plus two for terms. This is a plus 11 Mercury. Too bad it's combust, right? Um, <laughs> conjunct Regulus also down here. Um, too bad he's, you know, hidden in the beams of the sun because that kind of uh, changes things a bit. Um Venus also has dignity in a day in a day chart in earth signs and water signs. Um, she has triplicity dignity because Venus is feminine and, and earths and water signs are feminine. So triplicity dignity. Um, the moon also has triplicity dignity in earth and water signs by night. So the moon has dignity here. Mars has um, some dignity also, but not for the same reasons. 
Venus and the moon are their nature is feminine. So the so the water and earth signs agree with their basic nature. Mars has dignity in water and earth signs because their nature is opposite. Mars is fiery, but he's so fiery that it can get him in a little bit of trouble, right? So what you want with Mars is you want him to be cooled down a little bit and um, chilled out. So when he gets in the water and earth signs, that's where Mars also has triplicity dignity. So the, the whole nocturnal sect, that whole team of Venus, Moon, and Mars, they have triplicity dignity here because it's an earth sign. The sun rules the first decan, and of course Mercury has three different kinds of dignity going on. So this, this big lineup of all five personal planets is really interesting on that level. There's all of these planets have some kind of magical powers, right? Essentially. And um, it's really interesting to me, you know, one of my, one of my favorite astrologers in the whole world and one of my favorite people, one of my best friends is Demetra George. And uh, if you haven't seen her new book yet, Ancient Astrology, Volume 1, I, I just can't even begin to tell you how wonderful it is. And one of the things that she talks about, which I find to be really fascinating, is um, she actually talks about the different superpowers that go along with these different kinds of dignity. So specifically domicile dignity um, I'm on page 230, by the way, for those of you who have the book, chapter 18, page 230. Um, domicile dignity is the power of resources. So the planet has resources available to it that allow it to do its thing, right? So think about it for a second. Mercury is in Virgo, right? Nocturnal sign of analysis and um, deep, deep attention to details, right? It's like... It's sort of like the, um, the, the monk or nun cloistered away in the monastery, laboriously copying over manuscripts, right? It's like they're in their element, um, and they have the resources to do that, right? Cause, because you need certain um, inks and certain pigments that, that have to be um, procured from far away, and because you're in a monastery, they have the, the reach, the arms to get that stuff and where you can do your thing. Right. And then exaltation is the power of honors, respect and esteem. Right. Exalted. Triplicity dignity is the power of support from a community of followers. Bounds dignity is the power of autonomy to set the rules of engagement. And I talked about this a little while ago on my um, on my Facebook feed about, um, for instance, the battle between Hector and Achilles in in the Iliad right this is something that bothered me for a long time you know Hector extremely lovable guy I mean what what a guy he's got he's he loves his father he loves his brother he loves his son and his wife and and um, he's he's a virtuous guy extremely good warrior probably would make an incredible king you know um, and and um, and yet and and here's Achilles. I mean, Achilles is a great warrior, but he's fighting for this guy who he can't stand because of why? Because he wants his his name to be remembered forever, you know, he's in search of immortality. So, I mean, for me, I was just like, well, you know, I'm kind of pulling for Hector here. He seems like, you know, he's got his heart in the right place. And um, And yet Achilles sets the rules of engagement. He, he, he approaches the, and he says, I'm going to fight you now, here, now, on, on my terms. And Hector goes along with it. Why? Out of, I don't even know, like some sense of um, duty or honor or something. I mean, could, he could have just said, hey, man, if you can get your hiney up over that wall, then we'll fight, right? But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm sitting here in my fortress, like, you know, you, you want to sit there and shout my name all day? Go for it. Um, because it's a, it's a tragic thing that 
out of this sense of duty and honor to what? To some social persona. You know, they, everything that Hector loves be, is destroyed. We don't know. I mean, in the movie, they show that maybe the, maybe, you know, Paris and, and um, I can't remember his name, his wife's name, Andromache, I think, um, and the boy, maybe they lived. We don't know. But the city was destroyed and um, for what, you know, for, so um, this power to set the rules of engagement. I mean, people think, oh, bounds or terms, dignity, what's that? Is it even important? Ah, it kind of got thrown out, right, by modern astrology. Setting the rules of engagement is extremely, extremely important. It can be the difference between winning and losing, right? So, and then with, with decan, with face dignity, which the sun has here, so, I mean, I would define that essentially as the power to change your fate. If there's a magical power that goes along with these decans. Um, it, you can be subject to fate in weird ways, um, but you can also change your fate because they're, the decans were associated, for instance, with certain... Um, being susceptible to certain illnesses, and yet you could make an amulet to ward off that illness. So, you, so you're subject to fate on on some weird level, but you can also change your fate. Um, and that's no minor thing, right? Changing your fate. So all of these dignities are really interesting to me. Um, it's also interesting to me that um, you know the 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 um, the power to gather together a community of followers. What does that sound like? You know, um, oh, the influencer culture that, you know, oh, if you have a certain number of followers on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, you're an influencer, right? And now people want to give you money to hawk their products and so on and so forth. I mean, that's a big deal today. Um, way more than it was, you know, 20 years ago, for instance. So, it's interesting to me that it seems like that triplicity dignity is becoming more of a thing. And that's interesting because right now the, the social planets, Jupiter and Saturn, are in the process of switching triplicities from Earth to air, right? So maybe that has something to do with why all of a sudden followers are such an important deal and triplicity dignity is, is being elevated in a way that we haven't seen before, at least not in my lifetime. Um, so this is interesting. This alignment is really interesting in that respect that there's all these different kinds of dignity going on here, but it's also really interesting in terms of, um, what happens afterwards. If we keep following this, um, we'll see that what happens is, um, Mercury catches up with Venus and these two kind of stay together for a while and they'll, they'll be together in the um let's see they are ahead of the sun in the zodiac so they'll be together in the evening sky um for a couple months we'll have this sort of running conjunction and um venus and mercury do this now and again where they 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 go along so this is a different kind of conjunction than just two ships passing in the night right um much more similar to this idea where v, where Mercury and Mars had these three conjunctions. So there's this ongoing story. And then you can see Mars separating from the sun here to become the morning star. So you'll have Mars shining as morning star coming out of this five planet conjunction, and you'll have Mercury and Venus shining as evening star. And, I, and this will really set the stage. So this new moon will really set the stage for all the planetary drama that's coming in the fall. Um, so I think that that new moon is definitely probably the most crucial lunation or syzygy, as the ancients called them, um, of the year, in, in my opinion. So let's see here, um, to get back to something towards the present here, you can see, so here's that loop that I was telling you about, and you can see here's August 14th, right? So 
you can see here, here's Mercury coming up out of that loop, crossing the ecliptic, heading north on the 15th, right? So that's when this chapter of this whole retrograde loop is kind of, that's the sort of like the, the bookend, right? He enters today, enters Leo, and enters into south latitude, does this whole big looping thing, and then kind of closes the book there um, on August 15th, heading towards this big new moon um, at the end of the month. So yeah, this this I think is a much more, um, to me, it, it's definitely a much more astronomically correct version of things. And I think that it's a much more um, rewarding. If we go back here also, we can see we're going back in time, right? So Venus is going back across the ecliptic plane, right? And so you can see here we are. So you can see here's Venus below the ecliptic plane and gradually coming closer and closer. So this whole time, and, and uh, the other thing that I wrote about in the um, magical transits of summer is that Venus gets within about a half a degree of the ecliptic um, at the same time she's making an opposition with Jupiter. And that happened a couple days ago. And then she leaves about half a degree from the ecliptic as she's making the opposition with Saturn. So these oppositions with these two gas giants um, kind of bookend her passage across the ecliptic. And she's heading from south to north. So there's a different feeling. Mercury is kind of heading south. Mercury's, and if I were to quantify that, Northern planets are easier to see, generally speaking, especially from the point of view of the Northern Hemisphere. So they're a little more objective, a little more, um, um, we have, they're a little more, um, you know, engaging with maybe with our rational mind, you know, something we can see. Whereas if something drops down below into um, Southern latitude, oh, you can't see it as well. So it's a little more subjective. You're kind of guessing, you're going on feelings, you know. If you just think about the chakras in the human body, right? The brain is up here and the gut is down here. So you're going on, you're flying by the seat of your pants, as they say, right? This whole retrograde's about flying by the seat of our pants. Um, whereas Venus is going from a place of maybe a more, you know, instinctive knowing and crossing the ecliptic, maybe, you know, crossing um, into connecting the head with the heart or bringing the heart awareness up into, into a more rational place, right? So she's coming in the opposite direction. Um, and so these, these are really interesting transits that I think are, are worth paying attention to. And I think they're a much more useful, much more accurate and much more um, all ultimately probably accurate way of depicting these cycles than just projecting, you know, these stationary points up onto the ecliptic. Because if we look at that, I mean, sometimes you'll have something happening here, but if we project this point up here, there's not a whole lot going on there. It's kind of, yeah, it's starting to you go south a little bit, but there's really not that big of a deal going on. This one here happens to align this time around with something going on as Mercury crosses the, um, the ecliptic heading north. But they don't always, um, simply by projecting these stationary points, they don't always match up with any actual observable planetary movement. The actual movement of the planet north and south changes dramatically during the retrograde. And to me, the actual movement of the thing is what I want to look at rather than some projected imaginary shadow. Okay, so that's about it for this time. Um, Mercury doesn't have um, as much problems in cancer in terms of dignity as last time. The last retrograde Mercury was in Pisces. 
Um, and so there's, you know, mercury has um, debility there. And I, you know, a lot of people I think were having a really hard time with that retrograde. This one, while it's a southern loop, so you, it, things are definitely not necessarily going to make sense up here. You got to feel them more instinctively. You're more flying by the seat of your pants. But there's not the problems with dignity that we had last time. So, I mean, for me, it seems like a little bit of an easier ride. It definitely looks like the front, it's front loaded. This one, um, there's a, you know, it falls off from here pretty quickly and then it sort of levels out and then the back end doesn't look quite as bad to me. Um, uh, but, but be sure to check out that article that I wrote for astrology.com on cancer, retro, Mercury's retrograde and cancer. There's horoscopes there for each of the signs so you can get an idea of, you know, what house it's affecting your, your sun sign or your moon sign or your ascendant and stuff. And also check out that Magical Transits of Summer article that I wrote. It's even available. Uh, my editor told me, she wrote me an email saying, I wanted you to know you're, you're now famous in Latin America. <laughs> she had it translated into Spanish. Um, so that, that it's available to all those folks as well, which I think is pretty awesome. I, I'm pretty sure that's like the first time I've been translated. So that's pretty cool. Um, so check those out for a little more information. Um, and uh, of course, stay tuned. I've got some big announcements coming up um, myself. We're having the third Sky Astrology Conference next year, next summer. Um, in uh, Moffitt, Colorado, um, and we've just opened up registration for um, alumni, people who've been at one of the first two conferences, and um, I think it's around June, or sorry, July 15th, we're going to open up um, we're gonna open up registration to the general public. And there's a limited, this is a small venue. It's a Healing Hot Springs. Um, they've got teepees and yurts and camping and RV spots. They've got some rooms, but the rooms are really limited. So if you want a room, you gotta be ready to book ASAP when that opens up. Um, it's next July, I think uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, um, next July, 2020. The skies out there are so incredible. You can see the Milky Way is just like, you know, and Jupiter and Saturn are going to be at their most incredible brightness together, conjunct, right? So we're going to see Venus and the moon early in the morning. They're going to be together in the constellation of Taurus um, near the bright star Aldebaran, the eye of the bull. So we're going to check that out in the morning. Then we're going to head into the classroom and we're going to make um, Venus, Moon, in Taurus talismans. We're going to make constellational talismans together. So that ought to be a lot of fun. And uh, last time was just incredible. And, and the first one was too. Um, so um, be advised if, um, if you aren't already on the mailing list, check us out. We're on Facebook and all that stuff. Um, Definitely, if you if you have the opportunity to to uh, be in Colorado next summer, you don't want to miss it. All right, so that's about this. That's about it for this time. Thanks for tuning in. Have a happy Fourth um, of July holiday, everybody, and I will talk to you next month. Bye for now. Bright blessings of Mercury heading into the Southern Loop and Venus crossing the ecliptic northbound. So yeah.